Then it's my privilege to introduce our Chief of Sports Medicine, Dr. Gertzema. Did I say it right this time? Uh, and uh, she will talk about the problematic ankle in the handball player uh, with syndesmotic injury as primary focus. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, I'm going to try and keep this uh, short and also quite practical because um, this is a, a workshop session rather than an academic session. Uh, and feel free to ask questions um, or make comments as we go. So I'm going to talk about syndesmosis injuries in the ankle because it's, I, I believe, a somewhat neglected part of ankle injuries. And um, in fact, it shouldn't be. If you look at the statistics, 10% 10, 10 of emergency department consults are actually as a result of ankle injuries. But of those, the reports vary between 1 and 20% of those injuries would be syndesmosis injuries. And we did a study at Aspata a couple of years ago where we looked at 261 MR scans of patients who have presented with ankle sprains. And 20% of those had syndesmosis injuries with or without a lateral ligament injury. So it is a problem, and um, it's a problem because it, had, it may have such a high incidence, and in sport it, might be, it has been reported up to 35% in some sports. It's easy to miss. It's not so easy to diagnose clinically. It may result in longer treatment and also more time lost from sport. So for us as physicians, that guy on the right-hand side is the biggest risk. He's the coach. That's the coach of the New Zealand rugby team, and as you can see, you don't want to upset him. So we want to get it right. So in order to be able to make an accurate diagnosis of the syndesmosis injury, I think you really need to know the anatomy. So excuse me if I'm telling you something you already know, but just to briefly go over it, the syndesmosis consists of three main ligaments, the anterior inferior tibiofibular ligament, which is in the front, obviously, then the posterior inferior tibiofibular ligament in the back, and the interosseous ligament. And then there's also uh, the inferior transverse ligament, which is really an extension of the posterior one. So the anterior ligament prevents external rotation of the fibula. The posterior ligament prevents posterior translation of the fibula, and the interosseous ligament, lateral translation. And then of course the deltoid is a really important ligament there too, um, because it also maintains the stability between the tibia and the fibula. So the classic mechanism that's been described for syndesmosis injuries would be the, the fl uh, plantar flex, uh, sorry, the dorsiflexed foot, which then externally rotates with, with or minus a degree of pronation. And basically what happens there, the talus moves inside the mortise and it takes the fibula with it. So you get this external rotation of the fibula, posterior and then lateral translation of the fibula, and then you rupture the ligaments. But there are other mechanisms as well. Hyperdorsiflexion, because the anterior part of the talus is a little bit wider than the posterior part. Uh, and therefore, when you go into extreme dorsiflexion, you can widen the mortise. And also, inver inversion and plantar flexion injuries, which is the common lateral ligament mechanism. And we, we've actually, anecdotally, we've seen quite a few of these at Aspata, and we're really keen to look into the, the epidemiology there a little bit more. So here you can see the classic mechanism in a handball match with the player's foot um, planted and then there's a blow to the lateral side of the knee and this results in an external rotation of the foot. So the classification, the original classification for syndesmosis injuries was uh, done by Edwards and Lee, but that was really looking at lat latent and frank diastasis and that was really for high energy trauma. So we don't really use that classification. We use the West Point ankle grading system, grade one, two, and three, which I think most people are familiar with. Grade one being really with no instability, grade three being with obvious instability, and then grade two being the difficult one to diagnose and manage because it has a degree of instability, but it's not always obvious. So in terms of the diagnosis, the history is important. Unfortunately, the mechanism of injury is unreliable. Um, but of course, we still ask the, the patient what happened, and if you have a video available, then it helps a lot. Um, pain with weight bearing and particularly, particularly pain with push off is often described by um, the athletes with this problem. And then, of course, the high ankle swelling. So, anybody that has swelling above the level of the joint, you have to have a fairly high suspicion of uh, syndesmosis injury. Examination, as with all other ankle um, injuries, 
a delayed examination at four to five days is one of the most accurate ways of making a diagnosis, as opposed to in the first 48 hours. Um, so, and then we have specific tests, that, uh, things that we look for for syndesmosis injury, localized tenderness and the anterolateral aspect of the ankle and then more proximally. But it's important to remember that um, Van Dijk had shown that 40% of people with lateral ligament injury alone will have tenderness over the anterior inferior tibiofibular ligament without any damage to the ligament itself. So you can get a very high false positive rate. Then we also have to palpate obviously the deltoid and lateral ligaments because they can also be involved in syndesmosis injury, the interosseous ligament, and Nussbaum had actually shown that uh, the length of tenderness along the interosseous ligament correlates quite well with the severity of the injury and therefore the return to play uh, time. And then we should never forget about the fibula because um, with significant syndesmosis injuries you can get a, a rupture through the deltoid ligament with the forces being transmitted up the uh, interosseous membrane and then out, the laterals, uh, out, out of the fibula at the, the proximal end. So through here, along, sorry, through here, along there, and then up and out. So clinical tests, um, several tests have been described, the external rotation test, the cotton test, the squeeze test, but unfortunately none of these on their own are accurate. Uh, in combination, they are better, but really the individual accuracy is quite low. Of those, the external rotation test is probably the most reliable. Um, so the sensitivity for these are low, but the specificity is high. So when you have a positive external rotation test, there's a reasonably good chance that you will have a syndesmosis injury. Um, so it, it's about raising the suspicion rather than make, making a final diagnosis. Then we have imaging. We use the usual um, three views for X-ray imaging, so the AP, lateral and mortis views. And there have been various things described um, for you to look at the possibility of syndesmosis injury. Again, unfortunately, none of them are 100% sensitive or specific. Probably the most reliable is the tibiofibular clear space, which should be no more than five millimeters, and also the medial clear space, um, which should be the the it sh there should be a congru congruity of the um, of the mortis. So the space between the tibial plafond and the Taylor dome should be similar to the medial clear space. And if it's not, you have to question whether there's a syndesmosis injury. <coughs> Streets views are controversial. In, in my experience, we don't use them anymore. Um, the reason for that is that they're painful, they're unreliable in mild to moderate injuries, and they've been largely replaced by EVA scans, although they may be useful intraoperatively. Um, ultrasound is promising. The sensitivity is 66%. Specificity is a little bit better but they can't detect the associated injuries that you get with uh, syndesmosis injury. So uh, it's a useful tool, but it's not the ultimate way of making a diagnosis. And then um, CT scan is actually accurate uh, for, diagnostic, uh, for diagnosing instability and also avulsion fractures. And we have to remember that up to 50% of cases of syndesmosis injury will have an associated fracture. But really it's the MR scan, which I think most of us use nowadays because it has a hunt, well, it's been reported to have 100% sensitivity, 93 specificity, uh, and it can also detect all the other associated injuries. One thing we do have to remember though is that it's tempting to try and tell a player how long, how, how bad this injury is and how long that it's gonna take for them to return to sport based on the MR findings alone, and we have to remember that this is not reliable. So in terms of treatment, the aim of the treatment is to restore the normal mortis. Um, and this is, um, this is actually quite scary if you tell this to an athlete, that even a one millimeter Taylor shift causes a 42% reduction in the joint contact area, which obviously leads to degeneration, or the risk of degeneration later on. And if there's a more than two millimeter shift, there's more than 90% risk of degenerative changes and osteoarthritis later. So it's really important to make sure that you get the anatomical uh, restoration correct. For the treatment, it's, it's a little bit controversial still. Uh, grade one injuries are very easy, they're stable, and we treat them the same way that we treat most ankle sprains. Grade three injuries are unstable, and that's easy for us because we just refer them on to the surgeons. It's the grade two injuries that are the gray zone areas, and there's really no uh, 
clear guidelines in the literature as to what is the optimal treatment for these injuries. There's still quite a lot of debate as to whether um, they need uh, immobilization, whether they need non -weight -bearing, a period of non-weight bearing, or whether you do aggressive functional treatment from the beginning. At Aspital, we tend to put them in a boot for a week or so, and then we start getting them out of the, and, and some people would, immobilize, uh, would uh, prevent them from weight bearing. Uh, some physicians, if they don't have significant pain with weight bearing, would, al would allow weight bearing, and then we get them into functional treatment. So, um, most of these protocols are actually similar to the lateral li uh, ligament injuries, and it's phase-based and um, time and criteria-based. So I won't go into the details of that. I also won't go too much into the details of surgery. I think Peter is probably a better guy to talk about this. But um, it's just important to know that there are specific indications. Obviously, if there's um, overt instability, if there's any associated fractures which are going to re require um, surgery and chronic instability. Um, there are still some controversies about the screw fixation and what kind of screws you have to use, what size screws, and whether you go through three or four cortices. And there are some complications as well. And the suture button has um, actually gained some popularity recently. For, the, for, for us, the important thing is to be able to tell the athlete this is going to take 12 to 14 weeks minimum before they get back to sport. And I think that is a conservative, uh, sorry, that's an um, optimistic estimate. So, the take-home messages for me with Cindy's Moses injuries is it's probably more common than we think and we need to have a high index of suspicion, particularly if the player describes the kind of um, mechanism of injury where there's external rotation of the foot um, and when there's high ankle swelling. Um, the history in the examination can be suggestive, but it's not conclusive. The MR scan is the most accurate for diagnosis to date. And the conservative treatment, as well as the surgical treatment, is still a bit controversial. And then most importantly for our players and for the coaches, is that if a player has a syndesmosis injury, m most likely it will require a significant period of time before they get back to the sport. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gertzema. Uh, any questions? Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. It's been very, very nice presentation. I would like to ask you, Celeste, if uh, regarding the Tyler Dome, if it would change the prognosis or if there is any concern that we should take into account uh, when we do the examination or when we see the MRI, if it's already done, damage the Tyler Dome, uh, does it change the prognosis or our way of behaving with the patient? Sure. Maybe we'll put it. Sorry. For me, um, we treat, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an ankle injury with different um, parts to it. So you have to treat the ligament injury, but you also have to treat the associated fractures. So the Taylor Dome, I would treat the way I would normally treat a Taylor Dome, which is to stage it. Um, and then depending on the, the, the type of injury, you're going to do conservative treatment or surgical treatment. So. Yeah, it depends on what the what the fracture looks like, how you're going to manage it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, can we have some IT assistance? Any other questions? No, you do. Yeah. Uh, well, we consider. Uh, from a surgical point of view, the, the, in the athlete, the grade two lesions, uh, as the ugly ducks, the high ankle sprains, what to do with it. And from our personal experience, we tend to rely on MRI to make a kind of statement towards the athlete, what are the options. Uh, with the cost effectiveness of worldwide MRI scanning, even in athletes, uh, there are more and more opinions to use ultrasound for that, because of the simple reason that we're talking about of about this kind of occult instability that we could dynamically see that subluxation in, in the external rotation movement. The question is, do you think that ultrasound can be used? Or do you think, in your personal opinion, or uh, do you think MRI 
course, has the, the big sensitivity, but can we uh, change it to ultrasound, in your opinion? I think it's a very good question. And, um, you know, the way I would look at that is the same way I look at the Ottawa ankle rules, which is these rules are designed for uh, big emergency department um, practices. And this is where you have to take the cost-benefit analysis into account. So if you're going to deal with um, the average Joe Bloggs who has an injury and you're concerned that there may be a Cindy's Moses injury and you, you can't really justify the cost of an MR scan, and this is the case in my country, for example, New Zealand, you really have to justify why you're doing a scan, then I think it's reasonable to do an ultrasound scan and if it's negative, to wait and see how things pan out. Especially if on a clinical um, examination you didn't suspect instability. However, I think if you're dealing with the elite athlete, it's a completely different story. Then we're not talking about cost-benefit analysis, we're talking about risk stratification. And when it's a high-level athlete, if it's the world's best handball player, you're not going to wonder whether you should do an ultrasound or an MR scan if you know MR scan is more effective. So in that case, I would do an MR scan.